it's Johnny Candido of Candido Training HQ. This is something that I strongly recommend you try if you're someone who does not use RP at all. Because the biggest benefit of RP, in my opinion, is fatigue management. Garrett Blevins here is doing a set of three initially, and he's going to do multiple sets with exactly the same weight, not bumping down on weight. I want you to guess what his RPE is. How many reps in reserve do you think he has after this third rep? I would put this at RPE four, just from the outside looking in. However, he did not move down on weight, and by the fourth or fifth set, he actually added three reps. And by the last set, to me, it looked pretty close to an RP7. Saying RP4 is just not socially normal in powerlifting. It's just not the norm to do that. I mean, imagine doing RP8 first set, then the next set is going to be RP9 if you're trying to cling on to that same weight, and then you move down. I mean, you just be fried. And I think that's what happens very often to intermediate level lifters, that undershooting is better than overshooting. And the reason why I believe that is because if you undershoot, you can just extend a cycle. We'll have a special guest here right now, Josh and Zach from Data Driven Strength. These two guys are excellent for scientific information. Johnny for having us on the channel. Today we're gonna to be discussing low RP sets for strength and why we think they may have a place in your program. We need to train in a way that is going to mimic the force production of the reps on the platform. So from a practical perspective, this is often gonna be considered a single out of 10 RP or single at maximal effort to mimic the skill and the force production on the platform. Now, anyone that's been training long enough will tell you that it's not really feasible to accumulate sufficient training volume by only doing these heavy top sets. Right, singles, doubles, triples in the RP seven to nine range or so, we're, we're inevitably gonna have to reduce the load a little bit to accumulate sufficient training volume. So over this set of 10, the reps are going to decrease in speed, right? And it's because your ability to produce force decreases as you accumulate fatigue within the set. Early reps in a set provide the greatest stimulus. Study by Moran Navarro in 2017. The researchers split subjects into three groups. The first performed three sets of 10 repetitions, very close or all the way to failure. Um, at, and then there's a second group that at the same load, subjects performed three sets of five. So that's gonna result in the sets being terminated farther from failure. And then there was a third group that matched total repetitions to group one, so 30 total repetitions, so six sets of five, which also would result in those sets being terminated farther from failure. What the researchers concluded was that even when volume was equated, the reps closer to failure are disproportionately more fatiguing. So kind of combining that with what Josh just discussed, the reps earliest in the set are providing a majority of the stimulus. And as we get closer to failure, that stimulus is going to taper off. Very close to failure at a given load are actually the worst of both worlds. Right, named Preja Blanco. Um, and in his research group, and each of the four groups performed three sets. So we had one group that literally performed one rep per set. And on the other end of the spectrum, we had the other group that was taking sets to failure or very close to failure. And then there were two groups in between there, right? And they're all using the same load, et cetera. The, the groups that don't go as close to failure see slightly better strength gain, getting to those repetitions that are close to failure that are disproportionately fatiguing. But uh, these, these studies are not volume equated. So, so you know, it's important to take a look at those as well. However, we're really lucky that we do have one study in particular we can look at that is volume equated in a very similar design. So a study by Oliver and colleague used a periodized design training from 60 to 75% of 1RM um, and you, they had two different groups. The first group performed four sets of 10 that are very close or to failure. And then the second group performed at the same load, eight sets of five. So again, just cutting those, those sets in half essentially to equate total repetitions. And so what the authors found is the group training with eight sets of five saw significantly greater gains in 1RM squat. So that kind of goes to show if we do equate total training volume in the way that would uh, maximize the amount of like high force reps or reps uh, that are fast for a given load, it seems to be pretty beneficial for strength. Now, it's gonna be uh, really important to mention this is only a single study. For a new recent meta-analysis by Jukic and colleagues uh, kind of comes in. Uh, prescription versus alternative set structures, including cluster sets and interset rest, which kind of mimics more the six sets of five in comparison to that three sets of 10. And what they find kind of combining all the literature together is that there doesn't seem to be a significant difference for strength between those two uh, set types. If you're anti-science, don't give this video a like. 
I'm just kidding. I hate it when people use that word. And I would say 2017 to 2020, hopefully 2021, exercise science is more applicable to powerlifting than ever before. So if you're reading old school books, I really recommend you also follow some of these guys who are giving the newer information. So hear me out, because it makes sense if you watch the whole video. Now, some people might argue that if you have option one, you should just go up more in weight. So if you add 2.5 kilos and it's still way easier than last time, you should just go up to 105 or 107. I would argue for strength, that is probably not the best idea. Even if you're only adding 2.5 kilos per week, in a year, that is 130 kilos. Even if you push back that progression for a little bit later, it's still a very, very good outcome if you have the consistency and the patience. Eventually, on a linear progression like this, you will plateau. I promise you that it is inevitable. But you want to push that plateau back. That wall that you're heading towards, you want to keep pushing it back. You don't want to run to it closer and then hit the wall. No, you want to be patient and progress as gradually and almost as slowly as possible. Now, you hit that brick wall a little too quick. So with all progressions, it's really vital you back off far enough. Give yourself that runway to pick up momentum so by the time you get into the weeds, you can push it a little bit farther. If you're hitting a brick wall week one, week two, you're really not going to get anywhere. This so is where RPE and fatigue management come into play. As Johnny Candido says, the greatest benefit of RPE is fatigue management. Is fatigue management. And that's why powerlifters tend to use RPE way more than people who are physique focused. If you go into a workout as a bodybuilder and you're fatigued and your performance is the same or perhaps even down a little bit, that's not the end of the world. But for a strength athlete, Strength is the goal, and therefore progression is very, very important. The top is RPE 10. If you're always getting these grindy, all-out, super slow reps, you're going to go nowhere. I absolutely promise you that because I've experienced it a bunch of times. Always training to failure or near failure on the big lifts is a good way to stall really, really fast. Here is Yuri Belkin doing a 200 kilo for one bench press. And someone in the comments said, oh, you could have done it for a double. Yeah, he could have. He just didn't. Here he is squatting high bar, 200 kilos for six. And this is very, very easy. His squat PR is 420 kilos. So this is less than 50% of his max. Here is a 160 kilo bench for three. And you can see it's very, very easy. He's focusing on his technique, but it's very explosive and it is nowhere near failure. And yet he is one of the greatest lifters of all time. Here's Jamal doing some, some deadlifts. And again, like lots and lots of reps in the tank. And he's still getting a lot out of it. And this is because you don't get that much out of the grindy reps, and yet they have a huge fatigue cost. And this is more true the stronger you get. So most really, really strong people, they are very, very mindful of those grindy reps. You are learning how to grind. And this is a very useful skill, but once you have that skill, you no longer have to practice it, especially at a given lift. Anyone who is like, muscle damage causes muscle growth, they're not actually up to date with the research. But the fatigue is going up non-linearly. It's going up exponentially, for sure. And this can impact your recovery time. Studies repeatedly show the closer you train to failure, the longer it takes to recover. And you're getting those grindy reps. This exposes your weaknesses. Now, this is a good thing if you need to know your weaknesses, but if you already know them, this is probably not a great thing. If your knees are caving in, if your hips are shooting back in the squat, in the deadlift, if you're getting excessively rounded over, uh, in the bench press, if your elbows are flaring out more than they should for you, there's also a mental and possibly a hormonal difference in these sets that are close to failure, higher adrenaline, higher cortisol, impacted recovery okay so yes an all-out set of squats might spike your testosterone spike your gh but you're also spiking catabolic hormones which is probably not good for recovery and for long-term progression plus mentally these grindy reps absolutely take things out of you 
Also, soreness. If you're doing triples with something you could do for sets of six or seven or eight, you probably won't get sore from that. But if you're taking these sets to true RPE eight, nine, 10, you're, you're getting these grindy reps, you're gonna be sore, you're gonna be more beaten up, and I would say possibly your acute risk of injury also goes up as well. When training for hypertrophy, you probably wanna be closer to failure than when training for strength. And this is part of the reason why people have accessory movements. You avoid failure on the big three, and then you use accessories in order to get that other stimulus. Doing a heavy single at 90% gets you basically all the benefits of a heavy single at 100% with way less fatigue. A heavy single at 90%, the concentric might take a couple of seconds, most likely. A heavy single at 100%, we're talking five, six, seven, eight seconds in some cases. And you get a whole bunch more fatigue, joint stress, adrenaline, everything associated with that, which just takes longer time to recover. So it's a pretty clear choice when you actually look at it objectively and you take the ego out of it, which is often hard to do. And if you look at the old Soviet way of weightlifting, the majority of lifts were between 70 and 85%. A few under 70%, only 5% of lifts were over 90%. They just didn't need to touch those very heavy weights very often to keep that skill. They spent most of the time building their strength, not testing their strength.